What is this generative AI everybody is talking about? Not only will I tell you what generative AI is, I will tell you four points to help give you some nuance over this new AI revolution that is happening and will continue to happen in the coming years. In this video, I'll be talking to you about four points that I wrote in this blog post. Let's go over them quickly and then we'll talk about each one individually to help orient you on generative AI. So number one, recent AI developments are awe-inspiring and promise to change the world. But when? Point number two, make a distinction between impressive cherry-picked demos and reliable use cases that are ready for the marketplace. Point number three, think of AI models as components of intelligent systems, not minds. Point number four, generative AI alone is only the tip of the iceberg. Now we can break it down and see what generative AI is and why it's fascinating. So at the moment, if you're thinking about products that are out there in the marketplace, you can talk about text generation models and image generation models. These are the two most exciting components of generative AI at the moment. They're not the only ones that will come in the future. We'll have music being generated by AI, we'll have videos, we'll have stories that have multiple components. So all of that is on the way, but it all started at the moment with text generation and image generation. On the text generation side, we have models like this, like text generation models. I talk a lot about these models on my channel. They generally boil down to an AI system or AI piece of software that you give a piece of text to and that it generates another piece of text that is useful in some way. So if you've heard of any of the GPT models, this is basically what it boils down to. On the other side, there's the image generation models, things like Dolly, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, that are also super fascinating. You write a description of an image and it just generates that image and gives you variations of it. And uh, you can use it to generate art or brainstorm on, on characters or thing that you want to see. And it's super fun to play around with. I'm sure you've probably spent some time looking at those. Now it's important with all of this excitement to temper it with a little bit of care. So you will see a lot of demos, you'll see a lot of people saying, you know, I built this thing with this model uh, that, you know, does something that is surprising that we're not used to software being able to do. And this will continue to be more and more mind-blowing with time. But the important thing is to ask, is this thing being demonstrated? Is this reliable model behavior? So if I gave the model 10 different examples of inputs for this use case, is it going to be able to solve all 10 of them or nine of them? Or is it going to be able to do it five or, or six times out of 10? I'll give an example here with, you know, some demos we've seen about three years ago when one of these models, GPT-3, came out. And while it's super impressive in terms of its capabilities and surprising even to people who are very close to the field, there were examples of things that it can do nearly well, but they didn't really become products because the model was not able to reliably do them well. Uh, so if you try it a few times, it can get it sometimes correct, sometimes not. Um, but three years later, that's still not, for example, how we build websites. We don't describe them to a language model and have a website emerge. Now, this can come as a product in one week or one year from now. It's difficult to tell, but it didn't happen the last three years. And I bring this up as an example to say there are shocking capabilities that will be demonstrated, but it's important to really have a sense of, is this ready for the marketplace now, or is it gonna be ready later? Um, and for us, that's a lot of the times that is distorted because we tend to overestimate what is possible in six months or, or one year and maybe underestimate what is really possible in longer timelines. The last time this happened with, uh, you know, a deep learning frenzy came around, we were promised self-driving cars in four years. So this is an image from 2016 where companies were really pressured into promising self-driving cars by 2020, and this had not happened. 
And so that's an important history lesson that we shouldn't forget now. And then as things become a, a frenzy and the media picks it up and that sort of puts pressure on companies and shareholders and boards for us not to be sort of swept away in this mob mentality into another deep learning frenzy. So the nuance of what I'm saying here is important, is that yes, there is absolutely crazy capabilities coming out that software was not able to do before this uh, developments with, with machine learning. And for some use cases, that will be transformative. For some use cases, that is ready now to be deployed into products, but not all of them. Some of them will take time. And so having that nuance, whenever we come across you know, an, an impressive demo, we should ask the question, which is my point number two. Is this a cherry-picked example or is this reliable model behavior? An example here is that some of these models are able to solve programming questions, uh, but they don't do them reliably well. And so that's why ChatGPT, for example, was banned from the Stack Overflow um, forum for questions and answers of programming questions because the answers are very coherent, but on average, they didn't turn out to be correct. In the future, we'll see models that are much, much better at solving and programming problems and helping you program uh, as you go. But again, what I'm advocating for is nuance of when is this use case ready or not. My third point is to think of models as components of intelligent systems, not minds. Now, the first time you get to chat with one of these models, very likely might fool you into thinking you are talking with an intelligent system, maybe a human. Uh, it will be able to argue that it's sentient. But do not fall to that illusion, and because it's not a very useful perspective to have. I advise you to uh, maybe step away from ascribing the model that you would you know, chat with. I would advise you to not think of it as a mind with a specific individual personality or style. A more useful perspective is to think of it as the merger of two capabilities, the capability of language understanding and the capability of language generation. And these two capabilities you can think of as things you can build into software systems. So if you're gonna brainstorm about new types of products, that are now only now possible using these models, break it down into these two capabilities. And so whenever you have text, the model is able to understand it in a certain way and do useful things after that understanding, which can include generation. My fourth and, and final point is generative AI is not really the blanket term that covers everything that is exciting in AI. So much of what is super exciting in AI is not generative in nature, but it's able to create, let's say, more reliable systems that are also surprising and extremely useful uh, in their own case. And so if we thought about these models as the, the two capabilities of language understanding and language generation, we can think about a new class of systems that build after the language understanding capability, where generation is only one of multiple things that we can do after our system understands text. And so Within that generation, we can talk about generative chat. So, you know, things like the conversation that you would have with a chat GPT-like model. But also in generation, you can think about summarization or copywriting, or when you tell the model to, you know, write me an email about this or write me a poem or an article about this. That's also a subset of these generation tasks. But that's not the only thing you can do with a language AI system that you can, you can build right now. You can do... Uh, neural search is another one that improves search systems uh, beyond just keyword matching. We can also build text classification systems. So you can build into your systems the capability of you know, automatically tagging uh, messages or emails or, or documents. Um, and these are highly reliable AI use cases that are ready for the marketplace now. They're ready to be built into products and you can do incredible things with them now if you wield them as AI capabilities. I will leave you with a couple of more resources on neural search. It's a really exciting area. 
Um, I will link to this video by Niels Reimers, one of the pioneers in the field that explains what neural search is and how it can improve search systems and, and language AI systems as a whole. And so this was a look at what generative AI is, why to be excited about it, and how to have some nuance into where to be excited and where to have some amount of caution and important questions to ask when you see demos so that you have the best estimation of the various timelines for, for the various use cases. I hope you find it useful. The link to the article is in the description. These four are part of a longer list of um, AI lessons and observations I'm, I'm sharing from being very close to the field and working inside the field. So join me in future videos where we will be talking about a few more points um, to help you think about this new AI revolution. Thank you for watching.